Hello, buds. Welcome back to another episode of Weed Buds Radio. I'm your host, Rye. And as most of you know, I opened a cannabis dispensary in Northern Maine. And as exciting and amazing and fun and challenging as that is, you really need to look at the economics of getting into the cannabis industry and the economies of your business. And that's something that we're going back and forth with all of the time. And as most of you have heard throughout my grumblings, that taxes are one of the things that really hinder us as a business from being able to scale, being able to employ more people. And it's a constant challenge of, is this worth it? Are we crazy? Uh, Some might say maybe a little bit of both, but it's always time to go to the experts. Why hypothesize and sit here and fester on things that I know nothing about? It makes more sense for me to talk to individuals that wrote the book on whether or not legal weed can win. And so joining us today, we have the incredible authors of Can Legal Weed Win? The Blunt Realities of Cannabis Economics. And so I'm really excited to have both Robin and Daniel join us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, It'll be fun. So you two gentlemen obviously have an extensive knowledge, not just about cannabis economics and cannabis business, but about economics in general. I know that's a topic that you both have studied uh, and teach upon and share your knowledge upon. And so I guess my my very first question to you gentlemen is, uh, am I crazy? Am I bonkers for getting into the cannabis industry the way that I have? Well, let me, let me say something to begin with, and that is, you know, your local market, you know your local competition, and Robin and I may give you some background, and but but the most important thing is what's going on right where you are, and 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 we could say, boy, it's really tough, and here's some examples where it seems to be working more than others, but you know you'll you'll know your local situation if you've got 13 other guys that are undercutting you on price we could say gee the market's booming and you could say i'm getting screwed you know you see what i'm saying so so don't don't uh, we can have some insights about the bigger picture but you know your local stuff speaking of the bigger picture would you consider legal weed to be winning right now? Would you say that it's failing? What is your perspective on how weed is measuring up from an economic standpoint? Uh, Well, we don't think it's winning right now. That's for sure. Uh, It's, of course, a different situation in every state. um, And some states are doing a lot better than others. So one of the things we do in the book is we compare states that have, uh, that have, uh, been doing comparatively well with ones that haven't and, and look for some of the reasons why. And we say, well, we mean, you know, the state, the, the, it's, vi- it's a viable legal, legal market. Legal weed is able to beat illegal weed. Um, that's, that's sort of a success for legal weed. And it's been really hard in states like California, where we come from, uh, for legal weed to compete with illegal weed. Um, and the biggest reason is price. Uh, the uh, illegal weed is much cheaper to produce and sell because they don't have to pay all the taxes and go through the regulations and follow all the rules. Um, and, uh, and including a lot of rules that you have to follow to be any in any legal business, not just weed. Uh, and, um, but but a, a lot of specialized cannabis rules that only cannabis companies have to follow has made it more costly and, and more difficult for them to compete with the illegal guys that have been around for a while. Um, so the states that have done best are the ones where the they've been able to bring prices down and be more competitive where legal weeds able to be more competitive with the illegal stuff. And you, and you know, there are neighborhoods uh, where uh, for one reason or another, your customers don't really care about price that much. Not very many, but some, and you know, mm-hmm. and, and, or they really want, you know, you're in some town where everybody really wants to be legal in every way, even though they can have weed that's legal for them to have it. They want to deal with local legal businesses and that that's great. Uh, 
but not everywhere is like that. So, you know, if I was thinking about the distribution, it goes from really struggling to hanging on. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, the the boy, I'm, yeah. I'm just printing money here, uh, you know, at least as far as there, there are people that have made those claims. There may be a consultant that's doing very well and a lawyer who's doing very well, but it's it's tougher to find somebody who's actually in the cultivation business. And, you know, you know, it's also easy for people in business. And I do a lot of food economics and you talk to a farmer and he says, oh, yeah, that guy who's just one step up the chain from me, he's making all the money. And then you talk to the guy in the marketing, the distribution business, the middleman. And he says, yeah, the retailers make money. The farmers make money. God, I, I, I'm just, you know, I can't make it, make a go of it. And then you get to the retailer and he says, the prices are so high. Those guys are charging me so much. Plus, you know, I have my rent and the labor and who knows where you can get a worker these days. So I'm not making it. So you see what I'm saying? And, and I really do think it, it, it goes from struggling to hanging on. And it really, it, but, but the big thing about weed is that the illegal market is there everywhere. Uh, the competition from the illegal guys is always there. And that's the point Robin was making. That's the challenge about price. We're talking about legal markets and illegal markets and legal pricing and illegal pricing. And I think something that is confusing and misleading is the term legalization. And when I think of my operations here in the beautiful state of Maine, it's a legal operation. And I struggle to see where federal federal legalization will make things better. You know, everybody, I think, touts that federal legalization is going to, you know, make everything, you know, exponentially better. Uh, but the feds are making a lot of money off of me right now. And uh, they do control some of the kind of merchant services, if you will, systems of, of all of this. And so it's hard for me to see, well, what's the federal incentive to legalization? So do you, do you mind, you know, can you help, you know, demystify, you know, what legalization is, um, but why ultimately does the term legalization become so misleading to people? This is music to our ears because that's one of our themes and I'll let Robin elaborate, but you know, uh, one of the first things we do in the book is say this word legalization, we're using it, but it can be really misleading. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, and it's, it's, it can just mean a lot of different things. And, you know, for example, uh, when a state passes a, a ballot question or a bill that says weed is legalized, um, it can take years between getting from that point to getting to the point where you actually have stores open because states take years sometimes to, to drop regulations and so forth. Vermont, four and a half years after the uh, they, they passed a law legalizing recreational weed, they still don't have a single recreational store open. Um, Oklahoma, on the other hand, managed to do that in, in a day with what Vermont took four and a half uh, years to do, but that was medical legalization. So you have medical and then, you know, that's basically a market that's limited to state residents with doctor's permissions. Um, and that's sort of a lot more states are set up that way, as you know, than, than um, the recreational. But when we talk about recreational legalization, Dan and I, um, from an economic point of view, of course, you, you're, you care whether the stores are open and, there's, and they're doing business and there's a, a market. So uh, we, we, we consider full recreational legalization to only start at the moment when stores are actually open. And you can walk into a store and buy weed legally, um, and that and that's there's about 14 states that are now at that stage with recreational. Um, I'm I'm curious in Maine, uh, we one so we've been looking a lot of data on prices and also on the uh, number of dispensaries in each or retailers in each state, um, and and sort of so the density of retail. And one thing we noticed about Maine is that you guys have a lot of stores, and um, for your you know for your population and you and you also have the prices are on the lower side of the spectrum of what we've been looking at so i'm curious why you think that is what's the market like in maine i take responsibility for the lower prices uh, <laughs> no uh, 
but our store does take a lot of pride in that. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, Bud's Emporium specifically, uh, we have a guarantee that we are the cheapest recreational store in the state of Maine. And, you know, sometimes that means selling our vendored wholesale products for less than that vendor's own retail establishments. And you know, we've kind of made that guarantee because we know that price is the primary driver of consumer behavior right now. And within that, there's different parameters around selection, but it really is price. We were the first store to offer a $99 ounce in the rec market. That was lower than many ounces in the medical market. And frankly, it can be cheaper than what you get from Bob next door. And that really boomed our business. And that was something that took a lot of work, a lot of creativity, a lot of partnerships from many different sides. But that single-handedly took, you know, the average cost of an ounce in our store from about $200 down to about $125. That's a significant jump in 30 days. And mm -hmm. you are seeing a jump like that in the state of Maine, where for example, when we open the store, I think the average price per gram to the consumer was right around $15, $14 in some odd sense. And if I'm not mistaken, the latest reports are showing about $10.50, $10.75, I think, per gram right now to the consumer. And and we're below that here, you know, at, at my store in particular, but we built our business off value. You know, I used to operate a drive-in movie theater. And the only way that I saved that was creating the value of kind of reducing that barrier of the ticket price and increasing the value on food. Everybody brought in sandwiches. Nobody was buying food at the drive-in. And we kind of changed that model around where you wanted the food at the drive-in. It was good and it was good value. And so I try to take those principles and, and bring them over here to my operation. Uh, but it is in the state of Maine, you have 3,500 to 4,000 medical shops and which are you know, untested. Um, and then you have uh, about a hundred or so uh, retailers in the adult use market right now. And that's definitely going to grow, but there's a lot more hurdles in the adult use recreational market. The med market is a piece of paper front and back, and you can open a store within probably 72 hours. Uh, the adult use side is a grind and a grueling process that I think will get easier over time. Uh, but the barrier to that's very low as well at $2,500 per license. So I think, you know, if not the lowest in the country, one of. Uh, and so the barriers to entry are very low. And that's where I think, you know, branding comes into play and, and value and all of that here in Maine. But the economies here are very different. And when we see tourists from Pennsylvania, New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, uh, they cannot even believe what the price per pre-roll or per eighth is here in the state of Maine. Uh, and they want it, you know, and the thing that I, in my opinion, and you two are economists, but I think even having a market like Maine is going to drive the prices lower in Massachusetts and Vermont and kind of trickle down uh, because those tourists are going to start demanding it from their retailers, which to your point, your point, Daniel, uh, that works backwards. You know, the retailers will then put that pressure on the middleman, the middleman backwards. So oh. it is a very unique um, segment of the industry we are in Maine. So yeah, well, are you are you allowed to deliver rye? Is, is is or is it strictly storefront? Uh, because that that limits your scale, of course. It does very much yeah. so. And currently, the adult use market is not allowed to offer delivery that should be coming online, hopefully August, September, October of 2022. And when that does, I think that'll help retailers out a lot. However, uh, you know, that doesn't come, you know, without its own challenges and own infrastructure and all oh, of that. Yeah. 
in I'm lucky. I'm in the North Main Woods. I'm the only adult use store really for an hour south and probably an hour, hour and a half north. And so I've got a nice piece of territory where you go to Portland, you've got 70 stores stacked on each other, loyalty zero, and it's very price conscious. Yeah, we, we uh, uh, this connecting back to to the uh, point you asked, the question you asked earlier about about federal legalization, uh, I think you're really smart to care a lot about price, and and uh, Maine is going to do comparatively well compared to some other states around Maine when federal legalization comes in, because you're going to all of a sudden be competing with with stuff from all over the place. Now, you're you're also going to face competition from Wyoming or or Montana or Oklahoma, places that might be able to make it even cheaper because they have lower costs of land and labor and things like that. But the um, uh, the thing that I think people, mi- we, we say a lot in the book, the thing that people miss about legalization, they think it's just going to help everyone. And actually competition will help some people and hurt others. And, and so you're ahead of the game by caring about price, by thinking about price, by figuring out how, how you can uh, price, not just competitively, but under, uh, you know, at the, at the bottom of the, um, of the price spectrum in your area, um, and that's you know that's the skill set and the and the advantage that that'll be needed in the future with competition. As a retailer, you know what, what we say about federal uh, uh, legalization is uh, uh, first do no harm. You know, just you know. Uh, in fact, my motto has been uh, let cannabis be kale. We don't need a bunch of regulations from the feds. The states have been handling that pretty well and local governments and everybody else. So so and in fact, you know, this idea of federalism, this idea that different states do things differently. okay, you know, that's the way it goes. But what the last thing we need is to layer on another a set of federal taxes and federal regulations on top of that. And what Robin's talking about is the beauty. You go back to the U.S. Constitution. The beauty of the U.S. Constitution is it made a free trade agreement. So and, and let, so let's just accept that. So imagine the federal government did one thing and one thing only. It just uh, took cannabis off this schedule of, of prohibited substances or illegal substances, the, the list of, of severe drugs. Just cross, you know, all you did was cross that one line out. Taxes would change. Banking rules would change. All of those things are just tied to the fact that the raw material that you buy is on this list of illegal stuff. And and so therefore, you don't get to deduct it from your taxes as a retailer. And the federally uh, registered banks don't want to deal with you or they find it awkward because, you know, you're you're dealing with a substance that's on that list. Now there may be some other uh, places where somebody has to cross something out, but what we've seen about the federal uh, regulations, no matter who they're sponsored by, even the one that was you know released yesterday or today, it goes on for pages. And and Robin and I say, how about a postcard? <laughs> you know, you don't really have to do a lot here, uh, and. Uh, it, it, and maybe later you want to say, okay, we're going to add cannabis cultivation to some USDA program or something. But as long as you don't prohibit it, it it's there for lots of things. And, and so that's what we'd say for you. Yeah. And particularly you, Rye, and I would say your customers and the customers in Maine that want to take advantage of, of, of access to Washington State or maybe Eastern Massachusetts, where they have some particular cultivars that are tasty or somebody likes, fine. Uh, but it doesn't tie you. Uh, you know, when, when you go buy a banana, you're not stuck to buying a banana that was grown in Maine. And and when and, and when you grow, grow a an thing. avocado, <laughs> yeah, uh, same thing. You buy that avocado; it can be grown in Mexico. It could be grown. Uh, down the street from here in California, same with strawberries, et cetera, et cetera. You go buy strawberries in January. You don't say, God, it's coming from some guy with a hot house, you know, under glass, doing all kinds of electricity to, to grow a damn strawberry. Whereas in cannabis, it has to be. And so this free trade, particularly in the raw material, I think is a boon for your, for your kind of business. And, and uh, it may not be a boon for the cultivators of Maine that you could see 
some grower saying, wait a second, I don't want to have to compete with Colorado. That makes a lot of sense. And that sounds so hopeful. So I want to get back there <laughs> for a second. Yeah. Uh, but first, you would, you'd said something about, you know, legalization and then the feds will put taxes on top of that. But my argument is where, where are they going to put taxes on top of what? What could they possibly put taxes on top of? Because we've got our sales tax and then we pay our income tax, you know, monthly or quarterly. And they're getting a nice chunk of change on that, you know, upwards of past 30% of, of our revenue. Uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. Now, there's a lot of, if you've got big money, you can, you know, put a holdings company in between it and a property management company in between it. And stack and layer and all kinds of other things, but just straight up pound for pound, what would it look like if there was true federal legalization? Well, here's the problem. Uh, and I've, I, I've over the years, I, I lived in North Carolina for a while and I studied tobacco economics and, yes. and, and I moved to California and started studying wine economics, uh, you know, and so I can tell you there's a federal excise tax on wine. So if you go to the, your local uh, grocery store and buy a, buy a box or buy a bottle, it's got a bunch of federal taxes layered right into it, right off the bat, excise tax. Same with a pack of cigarettes, lots of federal taxes, then state taxes. Then if you're in a city that puts local taxes on top. So just because there's state and local taxes and regulations doesn't mean the feds can't put some more taxes on the product itself. We know they tax your business, your income taxes and, and other things on your business, but this is product taxes. Our argument is it's not needed. We got plenty of taxes already and particularly, and this is really crucial for everybody to understand the health of the industry because we've got this illegal business that is run in parallel. Now, maybe not in Maine. Maybe nobody grows illegal cannabis in Maine. I wish. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I wish. The, the feds aren't going to tax illegal cannabis any more than they do now. And they're not going to stop it any more than they do now. And at least in most jurisdictions, when you legalize it, the agency that's in charge of monitoring legal cannabis in Colorado, the California Rado agency that does that, they don't go after illegal cannabis. They don't even know how because they have a long list of growers and retailers and wholesalers and testing firms. And they say, here's a bunch of regulations you have to follow. And it's their job to make sure that the legal industry follows the law. Okay, that's their job. There's this whole illegal industry that's doing its thing undercutting your prices and everybody else's. And, and that's, a, that's the big challenge that Robin was emphasizing. Robin, I just told him that he was giving me a glimpse of hope. And then right there, just <laughs> takes it all away. Oh, no, you signed up to be on their radar and on their list. So I guess I have a question for both of you gentlemen before we hope, before we, before we end today, where's the hope? <laughs> oh, there's, I mean, I think there's plenty of hope because people over time see what works and doesn't and learn from, you know, successes and failures of other others i think we think that people the, the most hope is when people are willing to look at other states and see what what's worked and what hasn't be be honest brutally honest about what fa what's failed one of the mistakes uh, regulators have made as you, you you see more more and more states opening up and 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 it's like the default is they they just go copy the regulations you know they're writing up the regulations they just copy the system from california or from uh you know colorado and you're like well uh, why would you copy some regulations of of a of a or why would you copy a system of a state that where, where legal weed is not doing comparatively well against illegal what you know but if they looked at uh, what's going on in oklahoma with um the medical system there they're not at recreational yet but and they see how, how much that industry is thriving and they'll be probably competitive in an interstate market um then you you want to set up more like that so we're, we're hopeful in the sense that you know over time Maybe it'll take a century or maybe it'll take 10 years, but I think over time people uh, yeah. learn from their mistakes. He's the optimist. <laughs> I, yeah. But uh, I mean, the real, the real wild card, the real question mark is, is what you've been getting at, which is what, what form federal legalization will take. You know, so, so legal weed could, if, as Dan said, if, if it's just descheduled, you know, legal, that could really help legal weed um, win in a lot, in a lot of places. If it's, 
if they add another layer of taxation, then it's anyone's guess. It could it could be a step backward before we're able to step forward. Where, where, where your case is interesting, a lot of places, California is one of them, Washington State is another, there are several, where when adult use was introduced, medical died because they had essentially the same rules. Most people in California got both licenses when they were both available. Same, it wasn't easy. Neither license was easy. They got both licenses. And then the customer said, well, unless they were under the age of 21 or had some, there was no particular reason to get a medical card anymore. Whereas what, what I found fascinating about what you said was that if I declare that, and you always said medical in quotes, you always said that. And it's interesting that uh, uh, I look at you as a retailer and said, well, why didn't you go to the medical route? You could access a lot of customers you could have stores side by side, one medical, uh, one adult use. Uh, but but in, in most places, there was just no reason for medical once you had adult use up and running. And it's fascinating. So there's a case where Maine did something quite different than the rest of the country. We like to try to say, we like to strive to say that we've seen the future and we're trying to reverse engineer it. And it's looking at state by state that has come before us and trying to learn from their mistakes, trying to innovate on where they left off. And I think as long as we stay creative and innovative and ultimately focused on the customer's value first, I, I've yet to see a business model truly fail where the customer was ultimately the happiest. And I that's mm. something that we just kind of strive for here. And I think that's ultimately how the industry wins is being that industry that's not just cool, but it really truly is part of the community. And that's easy for me to say in my tri-town area of 10,000 individuals. Um, but also because of that, it's much easier for that community to know how hard we work to live up to that. It's much harder at scale to show the customer that same level of love. And that's really what we're trying to dial in before we replicate is how do we replicate true community value? Because that's that's what we did at the drive-in and it succeeded. And I think that is ultimately not only the way cannabis will succeed, but in my mind, it's you know that's the way it should you know i think the people of the cannabis industry hopefully most of them feel the same way that you know we're sharing love with the world you know when we put this in a safe legal fashion and bringing it and i think often that's why the accidental air quotes come out uh when i refer to medical it's because they should be the ones putting in the level of care the level of continuing education and the level of seriousness that we emphasize with our teams uh, because they're medical, you know, they should hold themselves accountable and they should ultimately be testing their own product if there's no legal reason to do so. And so, you know, we very much, we were licensed to answer your question, Daniel, why didn't we? We were licensed as medical. Uh, and when I learned that medical was not required to test, we bowed out and decided that that was not the values we stood for, uh, and ultimately not where we wanted to be in the marketplace. We felt that yes, we're entrepreneurs and not necessarily looking for a boss, but we are looking to be held accountable. And testing doesn't just hold us accountable. It holds the cultivators and the processors accountable. Uh, and ultimately, I think that just makes a, a safer product for everybody. So uh, that's ultimately why we decided to do the, the recreational side. That's cool. interesting. Uh, I, uh, testing is 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 an important one. It's one of the things that differentiates. If you ask what differentiates the legal from the illegal product and experience, and and you talked about both, and the testing is like the main, a substantive difference. You know, no one can um, necessarily uh, from smoking weed, from smoking a particular weed, you can't necessarily know whether the person who grew it or packaged it had a state license or not. But the the cert the the cert 
certification of testing means something to some people. Not some people aren't willing to pay more for it, but some are, and it matters right. to a lot of people. And so that's that's one differentiator. But I think you bring up a really important point about the the customer experience and the service uh, element of it. Um, most illegal weed is delivered is delivery, and um, there, there's something special about this in-person storefront experience. And I think some of the early um, storefronts that would open having to follow so many rules kind of came off as kind of cold it was like an apple store pharmacy kind yes. of thing where and you didn't really have it wasn't like such a nice experience that you that you'd pay a little extra to have that experience but certainly um that's that's uh low-hanging fruit for people who i mean that's that's a a big part of the experience is buying it and uh getting guidance on what to choose and this is a new industry where a lot of people um especially people who are who are just starting to explore it and ha hadn't been like longtime uh, uh, consumers of weed in the past, they just don't know anything about what to buy or what to, you know, what's the differences between products. And I think well, that's a lot of, you're delivering a lot of value by, by doing that. And I think that's important for people around the country to keep in mind as they figure out how to navigate the um, uh, legalization and, 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 and compete successfully with illegal. Thank you. I really appreciate that. We definitely we definitely strive to do our best. It's a humble family shop up here in the North Main Woods. And, uh, you know, we're loving every minute of it. And, you know, honestly, I just want to thank you both so much for taking the time to to riff with me today on all of this. It's kind of, you know, it's just overwhelming sometimes when you're up here and you're in your own head and you're looking at the future and you're looking at the past to predict. And it's nice to have minds that do that on a daily basis, uh, help kind of de-weed that for us. So thank you so much. And gentlemen, how does uh, the, our buds at home uh, find your book? Amazon. It's on Amazon. Uh, Can Legal Weed Win? The Blunt Realities of Cannabis Economics. Amazing. Well, thank you both. Tell so your much. local library too. tell your uh, local bookshop. <laughs> Yeah, etc. Well, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get our get a couple copies for our library here in uh, in Millinocket. Uh, yeah. So that'll it'll be fun. And I think uh, the community is always looking for more ways to educate themselves on cannabis. And when, I think one of the things I love most about this is uh, the community is part of this rally. You know, they are a part of the success of the store, uh, and they feel that way. You know, they're always mm -hmm. looking for products. So uh, awesome. And obviously, we are always grateful for all of you that are tuned in and continue to tune in to Weed Buds year after year. It has been incredible to produce these shows for you. So be sure to head over to weedbudsradio.com and check out those show notes. We'll have a link for you so you can go purchase the book directly, take you easily right there. And of course, we'll see you in the next show.